right, let's let it breathe for a second, and welcome to the Firearms and Fellowship Podcast. I'm glad to have back with me Mike also from Remington Society of America. He's got something super special to share with us tonight. It is one of just about a thousand rifles out there. Mike, why don't you tell us what you have for us tonight? I'm going to, we'd like to talk about the Model 411 or 411, however you want to say it, that Remington made. Uh, only made 1,300 of these things. They only uh, produced them from 1937 to 1939. Uh, they were done as just a uh, uh, gallery gun, so to speak. Uh, they were, thought they were going to have a lot more orders come in, and then for some reason, they kind of just stopped production pretty quick, and we don't know if the company who, who put the initial order out just stopped it or, you know, what happened, but they're they're very limited. They're hard to find rifles. Uh, if you do find them, being a gallery gun, they're probably beat up. Those things always saw, you know, a whole lot of action and, and everything. So finding one in really good condition is, is rare, but the guns are, you know, kind of hard to find, but they are, uh, they're a unique little bird. And we'll discuss a few things on them of how to tell, you know, the few things and what makes them stand out. Right. Now the, the 411 was, uh, similar to the 41 uh, and we can kind of talk about some of the the changes that they made for for the 411 uh do you want to you want to show yours or you want to look at some pictures first or well let, let's let's get a little history in so in okay. 1936 uh, in 1936 remington introduced the 41 which was mm -hmm. a bolt action single shot rifle a 22 in 1937 Crawford and Oliver Loomis, they were two brothers who worked for Remington, uh, were tasked yeah. to come up with a low-cost single shot that was intended for uh, the gallery gun, so to speak. And it was actually for a company called Steel Materials Corporation that was located out of Detroit. Mm -hmm. uh, the, steel, uh, the Steel Material Corporation, it was a company that fabricated and sold shooting games. Uh, they had one called Bang a, Bang -a Deer. Uh, you know, and a few things like that. So uh, Remington got the order, started producing the 411. Then at some point, the order just kind of got, we know the very first 41s, they talked about the ejectors having little issues with them, but they never had any problems with the 411. And we'll talk about that, the reason why. And they don't know if that's why they canceled the contract on the 411s, if the machines just weren't selling or what happened with the steel, you know, corporation. But the 411s are very unique in a few things that they were the only, they're the only Remington rifle that cocks on opening. Uh, they're the only Remington rifle that has no safety at all. Uh, they were only, they were the only Remington rifle that was ever chambered in 22 CB cap uh that's what they were the majority of the rifles were uh in 22 cb cap but very few we've documented in 22 short those are more rare than anything else uh but they're uh <clears throat> it's it's a very unique rifle like i said they, they were made for shooting galleries they were made for some of the shooting games mainly the old boardwalk shooting galleries uh, so yeah but yeah we can uh, we can dive into it a little bit uh, show some pictures, like some of the unique things, uh, you know, on them. Yeah. I'll tell you what, Mike, uh, CC Loomis is one of my favorite designers. Of course, he designed the model 34, which is just a fascinating, uh, mechanism to me. And just, uh, I just like looking at it, watching it operate. It's, and there's several guns that CC Loomis, uh, designed over the years. So just a wonderful designer. Uh, yeah, let's take some, uh, a look at some of these pictures that you sent over. We kind of highlight some of the differences that you're talking about. There All you right. Go. So right, right here, you're going to notice, this is one of the telltale signs for model 411. You notice on the rear sight, it's a very crude sight. Number one, and then number two, there is no provision for an elevator on there. There's no slot in the site to put your, you know, elevator in there. And the whole reason for this was the gallery guns didn't want you sighting that rifle in so you could win. They, you know, they put the cheap sight on there. So, you know, so you couldn't dial that thing in, you know, pretty much. But this is one of the, um, 
it's one of the really good telltale signs of the 411 for a gallery gun that, you know, there's no provision for an elevator. You see, like I said, this, there's not even a slot cut in there. All it is just one flat piece of metal kind of bent up, you know, up there. And you can probably imagine some of the gallery guns, if they got to shooting pretty good, and how many times that site got bent around a little bit by the, you know, by the yeah. owners to make it a little, a little bit more favorable to them. So, but that's, sure. that's, that's definitely a telltale sign, you know, the first thing. So in the next picture. So right here we have our stock screw. This is the screw that holds our stock into the rifle. Now you notice uh, the early ones had a slotted straight head screw. Later on, you'll get a thumb nut, you know, or, or neural nut, they call it or whatever. But you notice this one just has the two pins in it, you know, to, to uh, you have to kind of have a special tool to get that off of there. Uh, they, they did this so you couldn't take the rifle. Uh, if they mounted a chain to the stock that would mount to the uh, shooting gallery bench, so to speak, you, know, you couldn't just take the stock off, take the rifle and go on. Uh, so this was one of the one of the little unique features. When you look at it, you go, that's wrong, but it's actually right. Uh, you know, these are for the gallery guns just to get it so, so the people couldn't walk off with them. Yeah, for sure. So, yep, next one. And So here we see, it looks like it's a magazine tube, but you see there's no provisions at the end of the tube for inner tube to go in and lock into place. Uh, mm -hmm. This wasn't, this tube wasn't for loading. It was actually for ejection. Uh, the, the 411 was actually pretty simple of when you shot, you cocked the bolt back, your empty dropped down in the chamber, and we have a picture to show that later, and the empty cartridge would slide out of the what would normally be your loading tube. That way, the empties would fall on the other side of the bench. They would fall into, uh, you know, to the to the other side. So it's not on the boardwalk or whatever. And you can see here. So on the bottom is a Model 41. You can see it's single shot. You see the valley in the bottom, you know, for the cartridge. The top one is a 411. You see the cutout to where. When you shot and pulled it back, that empty would drop straight down there and slide out the front of the tube. So it's really unique, really rare. Uh, the seller who had this rifle was saying that, oh, it needs the, you know, inner magazine tube. But knowing that it was a 411, it didn't need one. You know, that's kind of, these are kind of some of the things that help you as a collector, you know, along the way. But it's a, but it's, a, it, you know, it's a really unique des design. That way, the whole purpose of this the cartridges, if it was in a boardwalk situation, they went on the other, either on the counter or on the other side of the counter where the uh, uh, guy working the stand was. Or if it was in one of the machines itself, the empty cartridge would fall into the machine. So all the brass would just stay in there, yeah. not out on the boardwalk. Somebody could fall and trip on it or, you know, step on it. So, Well, I, uh, I just, remember I remember talking to you, uh, uh, I guess, a couple of days after you had had purchased this and and you were so excited because you you had found this and and the reason that it was available is because the guy who was selling it didn't realize what he had he thought he had a a rifle that was you know missing pieces and and was not correct and you knowing knowing what you were looking for you were able to see see it for what it was and and find a, a really rare rifle yeah, and everything that he said was wrong with the rifle was actually correct with the rifle, which is, yeah. and this is where, you know, we talked about it in the, um, you know, about collecting. Uh, do your research, uh, you know, learn about these things, uh, you know, read as much as you can, look at as many pictures as you can, and you learn these things. Like anybody, a lot of other people probably pass this rifle up like, oh my gosh, it just, there's a whole lot of parts you got to buy for it. And how, you know, what can you find? And if somebody looked up to buy parts for a 411, you couldn't find them. Right. But me looking at it going, okay, well, everything he says that was wrong was actually right with the rifle. And that'll help you doing your research will pay off down the road because you're going to find these gems like this that you've been looking for, for, uh, you know, some time. And as you pick it up, you realize that somebody marked it wrong or, you know, it's like, oh, hey, this is exactly what I was looking for. And this is correct. So that's the, I see one thing I can't stress enough about doing the research and learning. So, and so but it's fun when you, when you run across stuff like that. I mean, it's, uh, 
it, it yeah. pays off yeah. all that studying and, and reading and, you know, studying things that you think you'll never come across. And sure enough, one day you do. And, and don't think that you have to do all of the research and become an expert when you start. Uh, you know, like with these, I, I started collecting 22s uh, just as a hobby, uh, Remington 22s. And then as I went, I learned more and more about them. And then you'll learn, you know, about these other, uh, you know, like these models were a little bit harder to find, lower production number. You know, you can, you can, as you build your collection, you build your knowledge and you, you know, learn as you go on. And you're finding out that too, you know, with your recent acquisition that you picked up, uh, you know, with your typewriters, you know, you pick up two of them, you start learning about them and that's going to, that may set you down a path to learn more and more. And as you build your knowledge on them, you're able to find those better ones to really uh, update your collection, move it forward and, you know, do things like that. So that's the, yeah. that's the one that's, good thing about it. So, um, and, and like George says, you know, uh, just having one to hold and look at and study while you're reading about these really helps. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see some of the things. Um, so now this shows uh, this is, this cocks on opening. So in other words, when you fire it and you put the bolt up and pull it back, it actually cocks, resets. So it sets up. And you notice there's no safety on the back. Uh, you know, the early 41s, uh, were they on the – I think they were on the back of the bolt, um, you know, to where later on they put them on the side of the receiver, you know, just right above the stock. But you notice there's no safety. That thing cocks on opens. So that's one of the unique features. The bolt is different than a 41. Now, a 41 bolt will fit in a 411, but it doesn't, you know, you can see the, the, the complete difference of them. Mm -hmm. I, I, was, I was thinking the 510s cocked on opening, but they must cock on close and then engage the safety. Is that right? They they may. And I, I may have misspoke when I said this was the only one that cocked on opening you know, thinking now, uh, I, I know it's the only one that had, that didn't have a safety, but, um, yeah, let me grab one but, real quick just so we can clarify. Yeah. For everybody. Yeah. And, and the 510 may cock on opening now thinking about it. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it does. It cocks on opening. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so, so it's, it's, that makes sense. I mean, C, uh, CC Lewis designing it. Okay. Gotcha. So, so yeah, so I, uh, and, and, and that's where learning about a lot of this stuff and going through, you kind of, you know, you, you got to go back through, brush up your knowledge, do a few things. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we were able to clarify that and, and make sure. So that's an interesting yeah. looking uh, mechanism there. It looks like it has a pin running through yes it. yes and and well you notice so you don't have your safety that's usually on the back of there so a lot of that would cover up you know a few things or where you can turn it you know or anything but it doesn't it just does not have it was never built for safety or anything yeah that is yeah. that's something you just wouldn't get away with today yeah 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 <laughs> So, and this one shows us that, uh, you know, the, the model number, and you see right below it, it's got the 22 CB cap. Um, and it's, it, it, uh, the picture was a little hard to get today, but it was, uh, the majority of these, like I said, are marked 22 CB cap. And that's all they were for, is just a small cap, the splatter, uh, splatter ammunition, so to speak. Uh, there are a few of them out there that are marked 22 short. They are rare to find, uh, you know harder to see uh, where they, was it uh, later in the production year to where, you know, Remington realized they weren't going to sell any for the uh, uh, the games or arcade games or however you want to, you know, we'll call them. And then they decided to rechamber some of them in 22 short just so they maybe could sell them, you know, outright. But it's, uh, uh, you know, we, we don't know just because the records are missing and we, you know, this is just uh, from research, you know, we've done and found anything, uh, you know, the, few things that we do know this is this is one of the rifles that was never cataloged um never put any never appeared in any remington catalog but yet it had a model number which was kind of odd and you know unique on on its own it's that's uh that's that's one of the first and only for you know for this rifle too so it makes it makes a little bit of a 
I hate using the word rare because everybody loves using that thing. It makes it more of a unique rifle. Like I say, with 13, uh, 1360 is actually the 1,316 was the total production. And they were only produced from 1937 to 1939. That was it. Oh. Well, and, and I mean, how many of them made it? That's, that's the thing. There might yeah. be a few hundred of them floating around out there. Yeah, and that's and that's the one thing you always find with the gallery guns. The gallery guns always seem like they were just, you know, they were beat up, they were abused, you know, they were set out on the counters, you know, flopped back and forth. How many guys probably got mad when they couldn't hit something and, you know, flopped that thing back on the counter, you know, a few things like that. Now, sure, uh, what would be really good to find is one of the original arcade machines, if you want to call it the uh, the the bang a buck you know, to go with this rifle. Uh, there was another machine that was made later on that was a, uh, if you want to call it an arcade machine, early arcade machine, but they actually took the Remington 514 and actually converted it to mount into that, uh, you know, in, in, into that machine. So Remington did have a little bit of history throughout the time of producing rifles and making them for, gallery guns so to speak for you know your regular shooting galleries but also some of these arcade cade machines so it's uh this is uh this rifle here we talk about collecting this is one of the rifles here that it probably took me 15 years to find one and wow. then um when i finally found it it it's in it's in very well used condition we're going to put it uh but i was happy to get it and then today i just talked to another collector that he, he actually has one himself, uh, and I think his is in better shape than mine. But it's good to know that there's another one out there, that there are, you know, still a few. And I say one thing about collecting. You may be looking for that one unicorn for a long time. As you build your collection, you're going to get all of the lower-hanging fruit, you know, uh, first, the easy ones to find. Uh, you know, and as you progress on, you're going to start looking for the harder ones and harder ones to find. And then at some point, you know, you're going to be chasing those unicorns down. And then when you do find one, it's a, it's a monumental task. It's like, man, uh, you know, it took me a long time, but I finally got one. So, yeah, well, I'm, I'm sure you couldn't hit sand fast enough to pick that one up. Oh, I was, uh, I was happy. And, and, you know, going back to the collecting thing, I probably have picked up more guns from my collection knowing what I was looking at that maybe sellers have either mismarked or actually didn't care. Uh, you know, my, my main collecting interest is the Remington double barrels. Uh, I was at a Baltimore show go and here's this 1882 engraved Remington double barrel. They only made 16,082s. Uh, the engraved ones were a special order only. And here's an engraved one sitting there on a table with about four or five rifles. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, it's got to have a price tag on it. It's probably going to, you know, he's probably going to want a fortune for it. And he told me, he said, man, make me an offer. And I was scared to do that because as a, you want to get it for the best price you can, but you don't want to throw too high of a price out, you know, thinking. And this guy was like, look, I don't do nothing with shotguns. I don't care. So I said, hey, you know, I'll give you 300 bucks for it, thinking he's going to tell me to go pound sand. He <laughs> said, okay. I could not get the money out of my pocket, you know, quick enough. Uh, to me, the gun is probably worth, you know, three times that much, uh, being that it's a was a grade four engraved 1882 in very, very good condition. But here's a, you know, here's a guy that only deals in rifles, didn't care anything about the shotguns. And so this is where knowing this, you can find these things or, or, you know, scouring the Internet. Uh, I don't know how many anybody who has a lifter. Remington Double Barrel just says it's 1873, and I have picked up some, you know, very good ones. I picked up 1879 model, which we've documented maybe 50 of them through the whole Remington Society. Uh, so that is a very, very, you know, low, you know, low production, hard to find gun. But they said it was 1873. So this is where this is where knowledge comes in. Oh. Yeah. Learning, well, and, learning the knowledge, and then, oh, go ahead. 
Well, it's good. And, and associating with people that, that know about these guns, you know, if you're, if you're somebody who really enjoys old Remington's, uh, go join the Remington society. You can, you can go to Remington society.org sign up. It's just $50 for the first year and a $45 uh, each year thereafter. You get four super high quality journals every year. They're glossy photos, wonderful, wonderful articles written in there by experts in the field. So go to RemingtonSociety.org, join up. It is worth every penny and it will pay dividends later down the road. And then, and then one thing too, you know, you touched on it, uh, you know, talk to the guys. Uh, that's the one thing I can't say enough about with the Remington Society is the group we have uh, are so willing and eager to share their knowledge and to help you with collecting. They don't look at it as, uh, and most of the guys don't look at it as competition. They look at it as sharing their knowledge, uh, being able to pass it on. So, man, don't, you know, don't fear to reach out to some of these guys to talk to them. If you want to get into collecting something, you know, reach out to some of these guys and talk to them and, you know, they can, they can help you along. Like, Hey, look, and a lot of times they'll pass on their mistakes that they made. So you don't make them. Uh, that's a, you know, that's a huge deal, you know, too. And, and most of the guys that I know that are collecting would rather see a younger collector come in and start, you know, picking up where they left off and preserving this than it is to worry about, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to tell him anything because, you know, he may get this gun or not. And, and, and I don't, you know, they, they're more happy to, they're just as happy when you pick up something as it is if they picked up something for themselves. So that's the, uh, that's a huge thing about the Remington society and our guys we have that I cannot speak enough about. I agree. It's, it's a good, good group of guys. And like I say, if, if you like old Remington's, uh, there's not a better place to be. Uh, you got the forum over there and, of course, you guys are doing the archives project, which will be available to members. Um, it's not just just for the big wigs over at Remington Society. It's for it's for all the members. And that is a big resource because, as we know, Remington didn't keep the best of records. They weren't like Colt and Winchester. Um, so the Remington Society has done a lot of work to bring in some quality resource material for the members to use, you know, if you're writing a book or, or a magazine article or something like that, it's going to pay to be a member of the Remington society of America. And, and some of the things that touch on too, I know. Um, so, you know, don't, don't be scared to ask questions uh, and how to ask questions through us uh, on our website. We have a forum. Uh, you can go in and you know, log into the forum on Facebook. Uh, that we, you know, we, you can go in there and ask questions. We also have a column in the journal called Rim Shots. Now, the Rim Shots column I author, we actually, I, I take questions and it, it's not just for members. I take questions for members and non members. Um, you can reach out, you can, you know, ask questions and either I'm going to answer them or I'm going to find the correct person to answer them for one of our experts. Uh, that information for Rim Shots is on our website also you know, about, you know, finding out. So we have uh, several different options of, you know, reaching out to our members or getting questions answered. So man, don't please, uh, you know, uh, feel free to contact us, talk to us. Uh, don't, you know, don't hesitate. We're, that's what we're, uh, to me, that's what, that's what we're here for. I know that's what I do, you know, for rim shots. Uh, I don't care if you're a member or you're a non-member, I'm going to, I'm going to help you answer your question, you know, as best as I possibly can. So now, yeah, do maybe some. Do come join us on Facebook. Yeah. We we have we have a public group over there. Uh, you can post questions. You uh, if there's uh, something you want to share with us, we would love to see it. Uh, doesn't have to be the fanciest thing in the world. It can just be your favorite old uh, 121 that your grandpa gave you. But uh, we love to hear the stories about about the rifles and pistols and and all that stuff. And it's not just guns. It's it's all things. Like Mike said earlier. I picked up an old Reming, couple of old Remington typewriters. Uh, Remington made a lot of different things over the years, and and the Remington Society uh, it encapsulates all of it. And there's members over there that have a, a a vast knowledge of so many different things. So yeah, come check us out on Facebook and uh, check out RSA. And and we have uh, 
we have experts in the, you know, for the firearms, shotguns, the rifles, the pistols. Uh, we have experts in the ammunition. Uh, we got experts in the advertisement, uh, which is a huge thing. Uh, finding the advertisements or if you have any question, that, that's where we got a lot of our information, too, is digging through a lot of the advertisements and seeing, oh, hey, they listed this gun at this year and then stopped at this year. We may we may not have been able to access the production records, but at least we can see where Remington advertised him. So that gives us a little bit of you know help with it. Um, and then Remington made so many other things, knives, typewriters sewing machines, cash registers, ad machines, bicycles, uh, farm equipment, you know, any of those things, trust me, uh, we probably have somebody, you know, that we could, uh, you know, access and talk to. Uh, we have guys that have worked for Remington for over 30 years that have knowledge that I could only dream about, you know, that are that are able to take questions for us or help us, you know, with a few things, uh, reloading tools too. Remington made some reloading tools. That's one of my collecting interest. And then you kind of look out at some of the sister or cousin companies, however you want to call it, like UMC. Um, you can also look at, uh, BGI, which is Bridgeport gun implements. Uh, when Bridgeport gun, gun implements was in play, it was owned by Marcellus Hartley. Marcellus Hartley at the same time was part owner in the Remington. Uh, in, in Remington, when it became bankrupt in 1888, became Remington Arms, Marcellus Hartley was one of the owners. So there's a lot of intertwined things with a lot of the companies. And, you know, this is all stuff that we love to, you know, research out and, you know, dig into or, or find. And, hey, sometimes guys even show us stuff and it helps us learn on it, too. So that's a that's a huge thing for us also. Absolutely. Well, uh, Mike, is there anything else you wanted to talk about the 411? Uh, no, no, I think we covered everything, you know, pretty much. It's, it's not a lot on the gun because we know, you know, it was only made for the two years, limited production. You know, we know what it started out, you know, for, for that, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the Steel Material Corporation out of Detroit. But we know they supposedly were supposed to order like 25,000 or so, um, but then – they abruptly ended the order. Uh, a lot of this information is in the great book that Roy Marco and John Gaudet did called the Remington 22 book, which is, it's, it's a hard book to find, but if you can find one, trust me, it's, it, you know, it's a wealth of knowledge, uh, you know, for those guys. And it's, uh, you know, so the 411 was just one of them rare birds that didn't, don't have a lot of information on for most part, but, uh, but we do have, you know, don't have a lot, but we do have some information on, and it is, uh, it is, it is a very interesting, very interesting rifle. Man. Well, I sure appreciate you coming on and, and talking about it. It's uh, when when you told me about it, I was I was really looking forward to to this conversation. Um, thank you, Mike, for coming on tonight, and uh, I appreciate everything you do for us, and. Everybody go check out Remington Society of America. Yeah, I appreciate uh, Thank you, and I appreciate you having me on here. And, Jeremy, I appreciate what you're doing for our organization, bringing it more into the light, because the uh, the huge thing that I always get at the gun shows is, uh, I, didn't, I never knew, knew you guys existed. So that's my goal is to let everybody know we do exist, and, and we're, out, we're out here to help. That's what our main goal is for. So, Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you, buddy. You have a wonderful evening, and uh, we'll talk to you next time. You too. Take care.